review session on the recent conference on the consciousness, models for consciousness held in Stanford. And from our lab, Ariel attended for full days and Alex went there for just one day. But uh, go ahead, um, uh, please. I think it might be a good way to start is to thank the organizers uh, for putting together a fantastic conference. Um, as you said, I was only there for one day, but uh, it totally was worth the, the long trip. Um, I know it wasn't easy to organize that from abroad. I said last year, this was the highlight of my year. This, uh, this year, it was true even more. Um, and if you move on one slide, that's a photograph um, that was taken on the last day. So I see Ariel on there um, and uh, it shows uh, about the size of the crowd that attended the meeting. So it's a, and it's a here, right? And Ryota is there, that's yeah. right. And Johannes and Lucia. Yep. Yes. Where's Alex? I'm not, that's, I was gone. That was on the last day, I ah, suppose, okay. Ariel. I see. Yeah. That's, that's why. It was it the sense. conference dinner? Is there other people that you wanted to mention within this, uh, with, yeah, we should which probably comes flag, up in the letter? Uh, that uh, the person who's second from the left, uh, who's standing, uh, that guy is Jonathan yeah? Mason. Yeah. So he apparently is the guy who did like the bulk of the work in preparing this conference and the organizers continued to thank him for putting it on and ensuring that it would happen. I think he's also mm -hmm. helping he's either the main person or one of the main organizers for the Oxford Mathematical Consciousness Association Network or something along those lines. Um, so we just, I, I will thank him again for having put all the work in so that this could happen. Okay, great. Uh, shall we move on? Yeah, there's, for me, there's too many people to mention. Um, the, the Stuart Hammeroff, I, I can spot and, and, and many right. more. Stuart. All right, let's move on. Yeah, so this is um, the first thing I wanted to talk about. Ariel, were you part of that virtual boot camp as well? I think you were. No, I didn't make the boot camps. So you go for this. Okay, so that was an interesting thing. Um, they decided to have um, a Zoom boot camp. Uh, Chantal gave a great intro to category theory for consciousness science. So that included everything about applied category theory, which is uh, specialized for, and in particular string diagrams or process theories and uh, how it's used for integrated information theory. And I have another slide to talk more about that later because I think this is a really interesting topic. Uh, Ian Durham gave a really interesting, uh, again, scientific, uh, sorry, philosophical talk rather, or philosophy uh, of consciousness talk. And then Larissa Almantakis and, and uh, Billy Marshall gave a primer on uh, integrated information theory 4.0. And my understanding is that uh, that included updates to previous primers they gave earlier this year. Mm. And uh, yeah, I okay. figured this, this might be something that might be interesting to talk about. Well, I, I'm very excited about IIT4, so I'd be curious what you think. Mm. Okay. So this is my understanding is IIT4 in a nutshell. So uh, there's some new notation. Um, and um, so this, I also understand, might be what's really new, what they showed at that bootcamp, which is basically saying that the big phi uh, equally in consciousness is the sum of all the, uh, the, the uh, relations and the distinctions. And this um, uh, subscript of R is a relations, right? And then that's right. D is the distinctions. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. And so um, I might have misunderstood, but the fact that they, that this is defined as the sum rather than, you know, the product or something else I, I find uh, interesting. And so if you go on to the next slide, this I like a lot. So my understanding is that IIT4 is making an extra effort to show how you go from the axioms to the equations. So this right here would be uh, one set of equations um, to uh, uh, show, uh, to compute basically five for the distinctions. And each set of equations, you can see here how uh, it is bound to the specific axioms. So I thought that's a really great representation. And again, there's slightly different uh, notation here. Of course, IIT4 
uh, the big difference is that the distances are now um, defined as intrinsic difference. That's what these log terms are. And then uh, mm. probabilities are now denoted with pi to uh, mm. ensure that they're not confused with just a standard P notation um, because mm. of, obviously in IIT, they're slightly uh, defined differently. Mm. So, yeah, so yeah, ju just a uh, uh, short comment is that uh, I, when I interviewed with uh, Larissa and also Bill uh, at Italy, uh, they were saying that uh, this update from uh, IT3 to 4 was like, let uh, in terms of the distance or update amount, it's possibly equivalent from two to three or, you know, one to two. Uh, so it's, it sounds like a lot of update, but in terms of the conceptual conversions or perfection uh, as a sort of theory, it's uh, becoming better. So it has a uh, new uh, components, but it's not like a massive, just a change from the scratch kind of thing, right? So that's what I understood. Yeah, that's my understanding as well. So basically you still have, um, as you marked on the left, I think, you still have purviews, you still have mechanisms, you still get to them by looking at the constrained versus unconstrained probabilities. Mm. The notation is slightly different. And, and so some of it yeah. I really like. Um, so using little arrows to indicate um, the direction of the cuts. Um, and things like right. that. So everything's a little bit more compact. Um, and yeah, mm. this diagram showing how the axioms relate to the equations, um, mm. that I think should be a really big help uh, to understand the theory from the bottom up. Mm. For the mathematically oriented people, this would be quite a helpful kind of move, I think. Yeah, yeah. and if you move on right. one side, so this I think is something that uh, probably you and I are quite excited about. So that, that's the formalism to compute phi for relations. And so again, the way it's presented is how each of the equations relate to the different axioms. And um, the notation is, is basically very similar to um, the one for the distinctions. And so the, obviously that is the really new exciting part about IIT4. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't super clear in the initial paper by Andrew and Julio. So um, this one should, you know, clarify lots of unclear part in that paper. Yeah, and I, I asked uh, Julio whether um, mm. PyFi will mm. be able to do something that Andrew did in his paper, which intrigued me um, to have a three-dimensional projection of the mm. relations and, and so that mm. you can get close to visualizing the, the cause effect structure. And so he said mm. that uh, as much as obviously there's computation limits, but as much as that may be possible, um, they're trying to make that feasible within uh, PyFi. And so that to me is taking this really exciting big step to not just quantify mm. how much information uh, rather consciousness uh, in, in terms of the theory might be within a system, but also to get at the, what the qualia might be like and to start mm -hmm. visualizing that then and examining that. So um, very exciting. I and spoke then, to Will Mayner, not at the conference, but um, afterwards, he's one of the people responsible for PyFi. And yeah, he was talking about that's what he is in part working on. That's very mm -hmm. exciting. And then the next slide, yeah, so that is um, the summary again. So I, 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 these are screenshots from either Billy's or Larissa slides that I took. Um, and so what you can see here is, yes, everything is pretty much as it was in IT3 that you're computing the, uh, the repertoires for the causes, for the effects. And uh, then you partition, you do these cuts and you recompute those five values. So not much has changed. Um, so except for now we have the relations, the notation has cleaned up a little bit um, and we're using the intrinsic distance. Mm. Okay. Just having said, uh, this right here is from one of Larissa's slide. And so I have a lot of questions about that. Um, I just put it in there to, as a mental note that there's still things I don't fully understand. So what exactly these power sets are and um, the visualization chosen here. Then if you go to the next slide, these are nodes that Johannes Kleiner 
put on the wiki that uh, the AMCS has uh, for consciousness research. And those are basically notes he took, uh, I believe during the ACC meeting earlier this year about what is new in IIT4. And I thought this is quite helpful. I think if you go to the next one, uh, that's the second page of that. Um, and yeah, a lot of that mirrors uh, my understanding of what is new in IIT4 and also some of the question marks that I still have. He did show that um, to Larissa and Billy. And um, so there was agreement that yes, this, uh, this is a good summary of what's going on. And uh, they both cautioned that, yeah, just wait for the, the paper to come out and uh, talking to Julia Tononi directly, he told me that it's, we're not, this should happen uh, maybe with, in closer to the end of next month rather than the end of the year. So it's quite exciting. Okay. Yeah, this one I put in is another mental mark or something to discuss. So something that I found interesting is that I think there's a notion uh, among maybe the, the people who are at the conference, and Ariel, please chime in, also feel free at any point, where, so the, the typical objections to presenting IIT, I think the first one that often arises is, well, there's also other theories. And then if you point out that the other theories tend to be not as formalized as IIT is, in, in the sense that there's no set of equations typically for these other theories that allow you to plug in neural data and, and outcomes um, a value like phi or a structure um, that relates to uh, qualia. Now, when people maybe start to accept that, then the next criticism that I feel IIT is getting is, well, okay, then how do you move from theory to something that's empirically valuable? And this one seemed to come up a lot, which is, well, if IIT explains consciousness, then it should be also explaining why sound is different from seeing something. And I know this is something that you also work on, and that's why I put that in. I think this is, of course, uh, I put here Andrew's paper that explains why vision or the, the perception of space, well, how that could be, why it is what it is, and, and how it could be explained in terms of IIT. But again, this slide I think I took from Larissa. And at the time, I didn't appreciate enough how much people would like to see that. And I think um, that seems to be an important part of the research program on IIT that might convince more people or might get more people on board if the theory can show why different qualia are different. Mm. So yeah, you have, I, yeah, this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ariel? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in for a second. So the, if you jump back to the previous slide, um, so Basically, I think Andrew and Julio have done a good job for space at giving a compelling argument for how IIT in combination with the neurophysiology of like primary visual regions or like grid-like sections of cortex um, might give an account of the phenomenology of space. Um, but as of yet, the IIT group has not done the equivalent thing for other sorts of phenomenological modalities. Um, and the, the key ones that they are currently working on is they have a paper, apparently the time paper is almost ready to be published and will be out soon. Um, and they're also working on uh, like objects. Uh, I know Matteo Grasso, for example, is very interested in objects and concepts and like hierarchies and like how that can be represented. Um, and another one they're sort of a bit, uh, they're interested in, but also I don't think is gonna be published soon is the idea of like colors and the intrinsic notion uh, so there's sorry where like the intrinsic aspects of colors comes from um, and that was a something I, I discussed quite a bit with Andrew and a few of the others when I went and visited and that one I think will take more work um, but I think the key point is like what they want to show is it, it's kind of less I would say empirical um, Alex and more that they should be able to derive from first principles like if you start with IIT and you start with IIT's account of how consciousness works um, you should be able to just like derive like where color phenomenology, where object phenomenology, where valence, where all of these things come from. And that's sort of the project that they're working on to see whether it can be made to work. Um, I think less than in an empirical sense, because like as other people at the conference point out, uh, like Johannes Kleiner and uh, Kobe Kremnitzer, it's sort of, this is less science in a sense and more like 
you have to be able to show from first principles um, that you can derive these things. So that's all. That they yeah, the flow paper, the time paper should be out soon, and the other ones they're still working on. Yeah, very cool. It's, I, 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 I'm intrigued by that. I, again, if there wouldn't have been so many questions on that, I probably didn't appreciate um, the importance of that. I think that success here would probably convince more people uh, about IIT. Yeah. 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 Just to add, so yeah, after the conference, Ariel visited uh, uh, IIT group in Wisconsin and uh, discussed further, right? Yeah, I so know. I have a bit of uh, insider to... knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> okay. I don't know whether, <laughs> what, what part of the things are okay to share and uh, not. So I'll leave the decision to you, but um, yeah, we can chat further if you have something to be kept within the, <laughs> you know, outside yeah. of the web anyway. Okay. So yeah, that, that's the side that goes with that. So sorry, I interrupted you, Ariel. Ariel, go ahead. I uh, just to say that I'm only talking about stuff that's public knowledge, and this is an example of how they think things can be made to work. So I think Alex was about to say this, but this it's not like I, I'm talking about private stuff that they haven't talked about in public. Um, they just have various ideas of how uh, the distinctions and relations of particular um, sets of things, I guess, whether it's grids, directed grids, cliques can be uh, identified with various aspects of phenomenology. And that's what they're trying to make work. Um, I'll hand back to you, Alex, to explain. Yeah, very, it's, it's very, from a neuroscientific perspective, I think this is also interesting um, because we do know that the brain has certain architecture. And so um, in a way, this is making, again, testable predictions about what we should find yeah. empirically. Yeah, so I thought that you know, this part of the figure is more like you know empirical, and uh, I was a bit surprised that you know uh, Johannes Kleiner or somebody else uh, in a conference uh, said that it's less empirical science, uh, as you summarized, Ariel, because you know as Ariel, uh, as Alex says that uh, yeah, there are lots of you know differences and similarities of the neural architecture across different cortical areas. And some of the you know, people actually ignores this difference and then just treat this neural circuitry as a uniform, but in reality, it's not at all. Well, so maybe, maybe this, I'll, you know, yeah. I'll make clear. So the, the, the paper uh, and this objection came up actually in different contexts. So the, the formal objection mm -hmm. is, for example, from uh, Johannes Kleiner and Eric Hurl's paper on falsification and consciousness, where they show formally uh, that if you, want to do science of consciousness, you have a bit of a problem in that um, if you say that consciousness is not just some function, but if you say that consciousness is some structure and you're identifying consciousness with some particular structure, like a causal structure, um, then it's always possible to change your structure into something that has the same input output functions, um, but which shouldn't be conscious anymore. Um, and as a result of that, uh, you have a bit of an issue if you're trying to empirically test by, based on observational changes, which systems are conscious and which systems are not conscious. Uh, and that's like the unfolding argument. Um, and there's, there's been a lot of discussion on that, but the unfolding argument definitely still unsettles a whole bunch of different people. Um, and I, I agree that I think the best response from someone who's an IIT proponent is to show systematically that like, well, maybe it's the case that you could unfold and have functionally equivalent systems with different architectures. But if you can consistently show that IIT makes these predictions about these distinctions and relations being associated with these various aspects of phenomenology, and we were able to show based on IIT uh, theory that we predict that when you go looking inside the brain, you're going to find that these particular structures will be there and they'll be associated with these modalities uh, like they've got up on the slide here. And if they can continue to do that. So for example, if they can predict that uh, color qualia will be associated with these particular like neuronal cliques in uh, cortical columns or something, which will have this particular structure. Um, and if they specifically, if they can make predictions about neural architecture, um, that 
like is not already clear or super apparent in the like neurophysiology literature, um, I think that would be a very compelling argument for IIT um, in a way that uh, hasn't really been fully fleshed out yet. Um, if we could imagine that like the architecture could have been different somehow that IIT predicted what it would be, um, I think, yeah, that would bring uh, people who are currently skeptical of IIT on board. That might still yeah, be so a bit I, vague, but that's the general idea. Yeah, so I agree with that. And uh, now basically, but uh, this part is, uh, in a sense, independent or meta-theoretical kind of prediction than a specific implementation of IIT, right? So if even yeah. if IIT is not, you know, in the 4.0 version or, you know, any version of the IIT is not correct in a real sense, but, uh, you know, probably Alex and I uh, share this, you know, intuition that, you know, different cortical areas are uh, contributing to different types of the quality or aspects of experience because of the structure difference. And also if you change the quality through different uh, manipulations, such as like uh, rewiring, then you should observe uh, the corresponding uh, change in anatomical structure and so physiological patterns and so on. And we can even manipulate or embed a different kind of sensation probably by changing the microcircuits in this way. So I think that's a uh, kind of a causal structural kind of, you know, ideas uh, of, uh, uh, I, you know, a relation to Claudia. It's not nothing to do with, uh, it's not really nothing to do with, uh, but uh, if you broadly think about the functions as uh, functions that um, affects on itself and everything else over the time, then eventually what the un un unfolding argument is saying is, you know, incoherent in itself because we can't over the time or over the scale have an exactly equivalent kind of you know, functions uh, even if you unfold it, uh, that's something that you know we are working on as a reply, and uh, we don't probably need to go into detail. Uh, but that's what I say. Uh, Alex, do you want to add something? Oh, I thought that was a great discussion. I I think that there's two issues at hand. One is that some people, or many people, I should say, uh, reject that phenomenology is is empirical because it's by definition an n of equals one. So this is there's a single observer. Um, so I think that from my perspective, I think that there's another interesting discussion to be had whether that's a valid assumption or not. Um, and I think the other one, yeah, th there's this work by Migan, Migan Kasur where he did rewire outputs from the eye. So the retina, the, the, the optic nerve basically to the auditory cortex and cochlear output to the visual cortex. and um, and then these animals seem to behave as if they can hear sounds uh, and vice versa. So I think that that strengthens your argument that the intrinsic architecture of different areas might shape uh, what qualia is like. No, no, no. no. They, they, the, the disparate actually reports seeing lights when they process this information in the rewired auditory context which looks like almost like visual cortical wired, like an you know, mm -hmm. Oplamna organization and also dendritic. So, but you know, there are lots of, you know, caveats and so no, no one follows up this, you know, uh, study. So we can't really say much. And uh, yeah, I, I think about that, you know, empirically we can uh, make a lots of progress if we, for example, do a high resolution uh, anatomical study of these um, sensory substituted people and more, fine-grained, you know, uh, you know, uh, analysis of these people, even with the fMRI or high resolution MEG or something like that. But uh, Alex, uh, one thing you said about that, you know, whether the phenomenology is N equal one or not, uh, I, I don't know whether we should actually go into the details uh, for today, but uh, maybe let, let's finish this up and then uh, talk about the particular aspects of these things as a discussion. Yeah, actually, I think Ariel, that Ariel, you wanted to say something. Yeah. yeah, I think because Ariel's research speaks to that, right? So it's actually quite uh, interesting. I, I think that that might be a bit of a long discussion. That if we're bringing <laughs> it back to the conference, uh, there's two things now brought up that was actually relevant in the conference. So there was a talk by David Eagleman, um, who mm. was talking about like the various sensory substitution experiments that he did mm. um, or was aware of, and there's basically there's like a huge number of super interesting. Um, techniques he's been able to get to work 
uh, including some cool technology where he like showed off this bracelet that he had where he could like encode, like you put on the bracelet and you sort of like hear the environment as vibrations in a way that works pretty well. Like I, I wore it for about a minute at dinner and I felt like I could get a sense of who was talking after only a very short period of wearing it. Um, but the problem is we don't have like good neurophysiology data from these people. And like, it'd be really fascinating to have an idea of what's going on in their brains when this sensory substitution is going on. And those are the sorts of experiments that I think would bear on this. And then the second, there was something else you said, which I was going to respond to. That probably from, judging from your face, probably uh, it's about my interpretation about the uh, unfolding argument or causal oh, structure. No, that's, that's, that's way stuff, too no? long. I, I can only just say okay. that there's like still a variety. Some people are really bothered by it. And like, there's a lot of people who still feel like that is an unsettled argument. Um, yeah, but I don't want to get into the details of that now because there's okay. plenty of stuff that already All exists. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, let's move on then. 